that I brought that was really heavy, so I want to um, make sure to talk about it. I brought Show and Tell. I have OpenStax desk copies now, and um, actually, would you mind picking up the books that are on the table right behind you? Um, I was in a presentation. Where well, I am super excited to be here and be talking to you today. Almost every talk I give seems like is a, an hour-long OER 101. And uh, Amy told me in no uncertain terms, this is not a 101 talk. We want to get down in the weeds. We want the details. We want uh, we want the pain, and we want the joy. So, so this this is a talk I don't get to give a lot. Um, so I called it OER Adventures in the Weeds. Um, of course, all the li all the uh, slides and everything is uh, CC BY unless it says something different in the notes. You can download, um, I haven't uploaded it yet because I was just making some last minute tweets to it, but you can download the slides from here uh, afterward and if you're tweeting about the meeting or uh, the event today, the hashtag Open Oregon seems like the right one to, to tweet at. So just to give you a little context about me, um, so I spent 15 years either as tenured or tenure track faculty, first at Utah State and then at BYU in their graduate programs on educational technology. And then a few years ago, stepped away from my tenured role at BYU and chose to become an adjunct um, there so that I could start working with Lumen. And Lumen is this organization that's just in Portland that you probably know about, uh, whose mission is to help community colleges primarily through this transition from commercial textbooks to OER. We do some work with K-12, we do some work with four-year schools, but we're really focused on community colleges. But so at different times today, I might be wearing different hats. I've got my chief academic officer hat with Lumen, my adjunct hat at BYU, and I'm also the education fellow at Creative Commons. So when we talk about the licensing, um, any arcane license question you ever wanted to ask, we can get into. <clears throat> now, despite the fact, where'd Amy go? She stepped out. Oh, good, okay. Des <laughs> despite the fact that Amy said no 101, I am morally obligated to give you three minutes of 101. <laughs> Which the, but which we'll get into some of the kind of advanced stuff. This, this word open gets used and misused a lot, um, particularly uh, this confusion on the idea that open means free. Open does not mean free. The entire internet is free. CNN is free, the BBC is free, the New York Times is free, National Geographic is free. Free is not what we're talking about. When we say open, specifically we mean free plus these permissions. So when you hear the word open throughout the day, I hope that every time you hear open, you think, oh, that means two things. That means that I have free and unfettered access to whatever materials that it is that we're talking about, and I have perpetual and irrevocable permission to engage in these 5R activities that Amy just talked about a moment ago. I think it's worth pointing out, you know, for, gosh, for the first four or five years, there were only four R's, a little bit of trivia. I don't know if you knew that or not, but retain is the most recently, retain is the newest R, it's only about two years old. And retain, it turns out, is fundamental and is kind of actually assumed in this model, but uh, it, was, it was kind of so obvious and so important that I couldn't see it for a very long time. And it wasn't until I started thinking more um, about Netflix and about Spotify and about some of these new business models that focus on giving you streaming access to material, but never wanting to let you actually own a copy of anything. Uh, textbooks are going that way as well. Um, but this idea of retain really is fundamental, because if I can't make and own and permanently keep and control my own copy of whatever open educational resources it is we're talking about, I can't revise it, I can't remix it, if it's you know up just free on a website somewhere that I don't have edit access for. Um, I certainly can't depend on it being there two weeks from now when I need it if it's somebody else's copy online. Um, so this idea that retain is fundamental I think is very important and isn't something that I would get into in a lot of detail in a 101. The, the other thing I think is worth saying here is that revise and remix are different R's because revise is not remix. You know, revise is about having one resource that you open up and you make some, you do some fiddling with it and then you close it again. Maybe you replace a photo or you change the words in a paragraph or something like that. 
Remix is as you bring different things together, and this is, this is actually the primary reason why there's a remix in addition to a revise. Remix has license compatibility implications and revise does not. If I'm pulling together two or more different OER, um, now I have to start considering how they're licensed and whether their open licenses are compatible or not. So revise is not remix. So again, when you think about open, think about it in this way, free and unfettered access plus a perpetual permission, and beware of, I wish I could take credit for this term, I can't, but beware of FOPEN, which is fake open, which are things that are free, but probably gated, that you need a password or you need an account of some kind, and where the copyright is definitely all rights reserved and the terms of use might be even stronger than uh, all rights reserved. So, you know, Coursera, any of the MOOCs would fit into this bucket, right? You need an account, you have to register, it's free, but it's gated, it's all rights reserved, the terms prohibit you from doing other things. So the TLDR on what is OER, there's plenty of free stuff that's not even interesting. What we're talking about with OERs is it's all about five R's, it's all about these permissions. The entire internet is free, we need free plus these permissions. So I want to just tell a couple of stories. I want to do three sets of adventures. I'm going to do adventures in licensing, adventures in implementation, and adventures in pedagogy. And we'll spend most of the time in pedagogy. But um, you know, just in terms of adventures in licensing, you know, we've been, well, I should step back. So um, let's see, in, in the spring, in the late winter of 98, um, is when the strategy summit happened where people said, we need a name for this thing that's happening that some people call free software. That puts the emphasis on free, which confuses people. We should call it open source. And this name open source was coined in February of 98, and everybody's familiar with open source software. Um, so later that summer in 98, um, I was, Cutting the grass. It's good to cut the grass. Sometimes your brain can operate when your hands are busy. I was cutting the grass in my house and I thought, it's, it's really annoying that nobody has done open source for stuff that's not software. We need open source for textbooks and for videos and for things like this. So I started this project called Open Content uh, back in 98. Uh, started working, first pretended to be a copyright lawyer because there were literally no open licenses in the world for anything that wasn't software. So I spent about five years impersonating a copyright lawyer, writing open licenses until Creative Commons launched, at which time I closed down my licensing work and joined their cause. Um, after working on that licensing for a long time, then I started working on kind of advocacy around it's important for people to want, you, you should want to share the things that you create. And did that for several years. And then came back around finally to saying, oh my gosh, people have created and shared all this stuff, but no one is using it. What is our problem? We have to, if we don't use it, no, you guys aren't going to benefit from it. All the OER in the world on the web doesn't help unless somebody adopts it in place of a commercial textbook. So all of that to say that my adventures in licensing have been long and painful. I'm 17 years into this open licensing thing, including making a bunch of them up. And all of the licenses, even if you go all the way back to the open publication license, which was kind of our, our first license, have this requirement for attributions. And managing attributions turns out to be um, hard and it turns out to be confusing if you're doing anything that's even slightly sophisticated. So um, the license in the footer, everybody I think has seen if you go to Wikipedia or you go to uh, any site that has an open license on it, you'll go, you'll scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll see there in the footer, you know, unless otherwise noted that this is, in the case of Wikipedia, a license CC by SA. That's awesome if everything on your page comes from one source and has the same license. Uh, if you're living in a world that's a revised world only. But in a remix world, you're pulling different materials together and just dropping a footer, dropping a license in the footer means that there's a license at the bottom of the page declaring everything on the page is licensed in a certain way and half the stuff in the page actually isn't licensed that way. So as we went through our first, um, we really seriously 
started supporting people other than me uh, in using OER and thinking about how to do that effectively kind of five-ish years ago now. Um, this license in the footer problem and the managing attributions problem were really nasty. You would tell people, yes, this OER is free, it's available, you can use it, all you need to do is make sure you provide attribution. And you know, how's that attribution supposed to get provided? What's it supposed to look like? Does it need a link? Does it not need a link? Am I legally required to put in the link? What does the license actually say I'm legally required to do in terms of attribution? And you know, you'd get that all set up and working and you'd, you'd, put, you'd put it down near the bottom of the page and then um, you know, three or four weeks into the semester a student would complain, what's that stuff at the bottom? It's kind of confusing, I don't get it. And the faculty member would go in and delete it because it was kind of confusing students. <laughs> And now you don't have permission to use those materials anymore because you're only permitted to use OER if you provide the attribution. So how do we make that all stick around and how do we make that work? And, you know, the, the matrix. Can I, oh, let me step over here for a minute. Got a couple of things I want to show you at different points during the, during the day. Oh, I want to show you that good looking family. Look at those. <laughs> that is awesome. seen this before? Yeah. This is where it's at. <laughs> These are Creative Commons own licenses and two of their non-licensed rights related tools. You know, the public domain tools aren't licenses because to license something it has to be copyrighted. If you're putting it in the public domain, it's not copyrighted. So we can't call that a license, we call these dedications. There's the public domain dedication and CC0, which effectively puts material in the public domain. And then the other six Creator Commons licenses. And it turns out that you can't just create remixes out of everything in the world because you know, any license with a no derivatives uh, term on it means you can't remix it with anything. And the share alike clauses run into each other and get in each other's way all the time. And like faculty members just want to use OER. You know, they don't want to memorize this chart and understand what it means. I actually, um, sometime when you're having trouble sleeping, I'd encourage you to try this. If you go to opencontent.org, um, you'll see this third link here, the open licensing game. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game I created for my students. Uh, to play to make sure that they understand how remix works. And there's a little, you can't see it because I have to scroll down, there's a little wooden tray here waiting for four cards to go into it. And you have to pick some text, an image, some music, and a video and put one of each in this tray. And you have to do it, you know, here are the, here are the different Creative Commons licenses on each one. You have to build out a remix that is legal and then after you've built the remix, you have to state what is the most liberal license under which you could publish your remix. Mm -hmm. And you check your answer, and it unlocks the first digit in a five-digit code. And you have to, as you play, every time you win, it unlocks another digit. But if you lose, it resets it. You have to be able to do it five times in a row successfully to get the whole code. And then once you have the code, you can email it to me, and I can give you. I don't know. I can give you uh, a good job email. <laughs> that, that's, how my, that's, how my students, that's how my students have to get credit for that assignment. So you know, this idea that, oh, you know, everything's open, just go grab it and use it, and it's all awesome and wonderful. Um, you know, it's not quite that, it's not quite that rosy. And, and then there are questions about derivative. You have these, these two CC licenses that have the no derivatives kind of restriction on them. What's a derivative? Like if, if you've written an essay and I go in and I add a comma to your essay, have I created a derivative work? Nope. <laughs> Turns out you have to make some pretty substantive changes to something for the new thing that you've made to qualify as a derivative. And if you've written an essay and I've taken a photo 
and I put my photo next to your essay, have I made a derivative of your essay? No. Have I made a derivative of the photo? No. No, there's all kinds of interesting nuance here around what you can and can't do uh, with these works that are licensed with no derivative uh, requirements that I think just aren't intuitively clear to people. Um, adventures in implementation. And I should say too, if at any point you want to shout something out or argue or throw something toward the front, feel free. So that's licensing. I mean, there's, there's lots of interesting stuff happening in licensing. How do you manage the attributions? How do you keep faculty from deleting them when students say they're confusing? How do you deal with where does the license go when there's multiple licenses for works on the same page? How do you know if it's even compatible? What can I drive? What can I not drive? Adventures in implementation. So, you know, there was a time not that long ago when the, the main problem with OER was you couldn't find any OER in your discipline. I mean, within the last, you know, two, as recently as 2007, 2008, now the problem is, you know, there's a billion, you put biology into Google Advanced Search, you know, with the open license constraint on it. That's not going to go very well. So, I think one of the first lessons we learned as far as implementation goes was, the first several faculty workshops we did, what, what was, hey, what was her name? Sean, what's her name? Lindsay. 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 <laughs> I'm Seth. Oh, Seth. <laughs> I'm Daniel. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> I mean, I'm David. Sorry. All right, so, you know, the idea that we can turn faculty loose, we can teach them, take 60 seconds to teach them how to use Google Advanced Search and say, great, now you can find all the OER that you need. Um, you know, getting a million results back is not, not an awesome experience for a faculty member. Um, you know, one of the things we did for the first several years working with faculty was we would help them take their OER and build it out inside the learning management system where students already know where to go, they know how to log in there, um, and it turns out your learning management system is a terrible place to put OER for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that on December 16th, I suddenly lose access to all of this content that is openly licensed that I was supposed to have retained permissions to. But because the semester ended, you know, Blackboard or Canvas or whatever now has locked me out because I'm not in that class anymore. And now I don't have content, now I don't have access to my open content anymore. As a student and as a faculty member, it's not the easiest thing to do to figure out how to move all of that forward uh, into the next semester. And at BYU, we have this joke that if um, if Facebook worked like your learning management system, every 15 weeks Facebook would delete all your friends, delete all your photos, <laughs> unsubscribe you from all of your groups. And it's just that the learning management system is the place where collaboration goes to die. Right. All the discussions that you had, gone every 15 weeks. Everything you uploaded, gone every 15 weeks. It's just a terrible place to put OER, particularly if you're making some changes to OER and I'm making some changes to mine and you've made some changes to yours. And at the end of the term, we want to sit down and talk about like, what did you change? What's new and how you did yours? What revisions or remixes did you make? And what did I do? everybody's locked out, I've got to add you as a faculty member to be able to come look at mine, or I've got to export it all as a common cartridge and unzip it and figure out how to do something with it. It's just the, you know, the, the basic assumption of the LMS is copyrighted content that needs access controls on it that people shouldn't be able to access until they're in the class and shouldn't be able to access after they're not in the class. And not, not great. Um, you know, we did realize that open standards are your, our friend, your friend. Um, I mean, using common cartridge is a lot better than having nothing at all for moving things around. Or if, if I say common cartridge or QTI or LTI, was it Jen? I'm Jen. Jen loves her some QTI back no, right there. I know what you're about. Okay, but, but you don't love it? All right. Well, we'll, we'll talk more about this in, in a bit, but. Um, you know, so common cartridge is a supposedly universal language spoken by all learning management systems that you can use to export all of your content into a specially formatted zip file that then you can take and put into another. Uh, LTI, which stands for Learning Tools Interoperability, is the standard that publishers use to 
show their content inside your learning management system without ever letting you make a copy of their content. Um, and QTI is the question and test interoperability standard, and that's how you can move quizzes and things like that back and forth between different courses. So those are important. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. And probably, you know, I think one of the things we've been appreciating more <coughs> recently is that there are some disciplines where OER is hard to do. Um, in, in, a, in the STEM disciplines, which, you know, get all the love and all the money anyway, um, right? I'm a music undergrad, BFA undergrad, by the way, so not that I'm bitter at all. Um, you know, in the STEM disciplines, you're talking about you're talking about the central limit theorem, or you're talking about the laws of thermodynamics, or whatever it is. The the thing that you're studying is an idea, or it's a concept, or it's a model, and I can go in and I can write my explanation of the central limit theorem that is. I, that I think is clear and awesome, and I can choose to put an open license on that. And it can be an open source alternative to some Pearson textbooks explanation of the central limit theorem. <laughs> Soundtrack. <laughs> but um, you know, in, in the STEM and some of those other disciplines where the primary object of study is an idea or a concept or a model, in the humanities often the, the primary object of study is an artifact. It's the Mona Lisa, it's the Catcher in the Rye, it's a recording of a Shostakovich piece, actually directed by Shostakovich, and there's no open source equivalent of Catcher in the Rye. There's no open source equivalent of, you know, Harry Potter or of Shostakovich recording or something like that. So, you know, it, it becomes interesting when you look at what you try to do when you're implementing OER programs, um, and you've got courses about modern literature. You know, what do you do? There's no open source equivalent for those things. You can, you can create open pieces that you wrap around the outside, the discussion questions, uh, the exam questions, things like that. But you end up with kind of this hollow core issue sometimes when you're working in the humanities. Um, you know, I, th I think the last thing that we've learned and that we continue to learn is that there's tons of work going on in the OER space and everybody kind of works on their own problem, which is what they should work on, because uh, we should all work on solving our own problems. <laughs> Eric Raymond's first law. Anybody read Cathedral in the Bazaar? Now I'm really geeking out. <laughs> okay, so in, um, back in the late 90s, Eric Raymond, who was one of the people at that first uh, strategy meeting where they came up with the phrase open source, I wrote this amazing essay where he described what open source software is called the Cathedral and the Bazaar. And he outlined several rules of open source software in there. And, uh, one of the very first ones is that every good piece of software starts with the developer scratching his own itch. And uh, when we work on OER, we should all be you know, scratching our own itch. Because you're revising and remixing for your own students, not for some fake make-believe students out there somewhere who you don't know about. The whole point of open licensing is to make something that's awesome for your students and then put it online with permission so that I can get it and I can tweak it to make it awesome for my students, and I don't have to use it exactly the way you left it. Anyway, we're all scratching our own itches, and there's all this work being done that um, doesn't come together unless there's somebody actually paying attention to it and playing kind of a stewardship role. And so, you know, this is an example of biology uh, that Lumen works on. You know, there's a, there's a great book on biology from OpenStax College, but there's also... There is. And there it is, in, in dead tree form. Um, you know, there's a great book from OpenStax, but there's also good videos from Khan Academy. There's great uh, illustrations and other imagery from Wikimedia Commons. FET has great simulations available. Uh, Northern Virginia Community College has contributed a fully openly licensed set of PowerPoint slides that you can use when you teach this class, as well as some labs. College of the Redwoods has developed some labs and some assessments and some discussion questions. Uh, the Open Course Library up in Washington had some labs that they did. So it, it's all of this snowballs together. If every time, you know, the, the first college that Lumen works with, who say they want to, they say we want to do biology. You say, great, here's this Open Stax book, and they say, well, that's awesome, but like I need powerpoints, I need assessments. Like, what labs are my kids going to do? Like, how's all that going to work? You say, well. Uh, Let's pick one of those problems and solve it 
And so, you know, Northern Virginia might create the PowerPoint slides. And then when we work with College of the Redwoods, we say, well, there's a book and there's PowerPoint slides. Like, what is it that gives you pain that doesn't exist there? What can you create? And then they can create some labs or they can create some assessments or discussion questions. And then the next school we work with, we can say, hey, good news, there's a book, there's PowerPoint slides, there's assessments and discussions. Like, what else do you want? Well, it'd be great if there are some simulations for people to play with. Oh, actually, those exist somewhere out there in the world. FET has already made them. Um, so this idea that OER is about, I have a textbook, and I want to replace it with a textbook, is, um, is way under-conceptualizing what OER is about. Way under-conceptualizing it. There's this opportunity for it to snowball into you did this work and that can be somebody else's work which can be added to another person's work which can be added to a fifth person's work that turns uh, you know a textbook replacement into something that's a lot more uh, than even the OpenStax textbook which is a great resource but again you add video you add simulations additional imagery discussion questions labs PowerPoints things like that now it turns into something that's uh, that's much more powerful so, so, you know, kind of starting to pivot away from implementation adventures and talk about uh, pedagogical adventures. Um, you know, there are really three, and yes, it's already been pointed out to me, all my lists start with RE, I get it, I'll work on it. There are really three ways of thinking about kind of implementation of OER or adoption of OER. The first is replace strategy where you say, I used to use that textbook and now I'm going to use this textbook. And your pedagogy doesn't change. Your approach doesn't change, you just swap out one for the other. And I haven't included, um, you know, stepping, stepping back for a second, I haven't included any research in this deck because this isn't a research talk. Um, but just let me say that uh, you know, for the last seven-ish years, my research, my research group at BYU has been focused on questions of what are the empirically verifiable impacts on student outcomes when faculty adopt OER instead of commercial textbooks. And what you'll see is, does that work? Woo! There we go. I just need a cat now and I'm good to go. Um, when, you, when you adopt this replace strategy where you just say, I'm going to stop using this expensive book and start using this other book instead, that's awesome and students save a ton of money and the learning outcomes are typically exactly the same which if you can get the same outcomes for 95% less money or whatever, if you buy a printed book or whatever, that's terrific. Um, but there are two other ways you can think about. One is this, this idea of realigning is just, and I'll talk about this in more detail in a second, but just the basic idea of saying, pretend that no textbooks exist in the world, look at the outcomes on your syllabus and let's build, let's go and find multiple OER that we'll select and match to each outcome and just build up a textbook replacement with the outcomes as table of contents, which starts to get us into backward design. And then rethink uh, is really not just rethinking uh, how you're bringing content together in support of your outcomes, but starting to think about your assessment approach as well. So I, I think really the key question here is kind of what, what is it that Open uniquely allows me to do? What do the 5R permissions make it possible for me to do pedagogically that I can't do otherwise? So I, I wanted to share some small pieces of this uh, 5R open course design framework. Um, you know, so the, the goals of the framework here are things that can be implemented by normal people, not trained instructional designers like the people we create in my graduate program. Um, admit that we're oversimplifying, that there are way more sophisticated versions of all the things that are talked about in the framework, but that even using the simple versions of them gets us further along than we typically are, and just kind of create an opportunity for conversation about uh, how can practice change in the context of open. So, so I came out of a graduate program on, it's called Instructional Psychology and Technology, instruct, Instructional Design and Psychometrics, Measurement Theory kind of stuff, so this is my background. And my approach to this is, you know, let's take everything we know about how learning currently works, assume it's innocent until proven guilty, assume it works in the context of open until we figure out that it doesn't. And it turns out that, you know, it generally does. Any of you know this book, Visible Learning, by John Hattie? Can I get some testimony about this book? It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. 
It's the briefest testimony ever. I cede my 59 seconds back to the Honorable Senator from... It is, yeah, if you love data, this is a good book, right? So Visible Learning is a book that conducts a meta-analysis of meta-analyses. Okay, so it's essentially a big meta-analysis of 800 meta-analyses that include 50,000 studies and over 80 million learners. So what John has done is he's gone, th and if you're familiar with meta-analysis as, as a technique, you look at several different studies, you convert the, uh, the outcomes of those stu studies to a common metric called the effect size, and then you can ask questions about, for all the research that's been done in blah, what is the overall effect? What's the overall impact? And this, the effect size is, is quite important here. Um, because it's the, it's the common denominator that all the study outcomes get converted into. That's independent of sample size. And John goes to quite a bit of trouble to, to help you believe, to make you believe, that taking a class from a faculty member who's not doing anything out of the ordinary should have an effect size of somewhere between 0.25 and 0.4 on your learning. And so he says, only, only things that we can do with an effect size bigger than 0.4 should be interesting to us, because anything else is just what we would expect to happen with somebody walking in and, and being at the front of the room. So I want to talk about a couple of the kind of effective pedagogical practices that are outlined. And I'm going to, in the bottom right hand corner here, but I realize now that may have been the wrong place to put it. You might not be able to see it. It's not on this slide, but as I go forward, I'll put the label and so you can download the slides later and look at it. The label uh, from the section in John's book where he talks about it and the effect size um, there. But, you know, why? Okay, well, we already talked about this. We'll skip that. Okay. So before I wade, or maybe I should say blunder kind of ignorantly into a religious war of some kind, do you guys generally prefer learning objectives, learning outcomes, competencies? Like, is there some consensus among the group? Okay, all right. I, I'm just, I'm probably going to say outcomes, and please just put the little babble fish in your ear and let it convert into whatever it is that you need to hear to not be angry when I say outcomes. So, starting from outcomes is really important. You can see down, if you can see down here at the bottom, you know, two of the things that John looks at in the book are teacher clarity in terms of how specific and clear they are about what they're expecting and what they want, and helping helping students set goals. And these are quite quite large, uh, you know, like 0 0.75, 0 0.56, in terms of their impact. Um, everybody knows the famous dialogue between the Cheshire Cat and Alice. I won't read it to you. I'll just pause and take a drink for a moment, and you can read it. So this, this is why we have outcomes for our courses, right? Otherwise, we just kind of wander around and talk about stuff, and we end up somewhere if we talk long enough, and it might even be related to what the course is about. So, you know, I think the first thing to think about here is really investing in your objectives, because they're the foundation of everything that comes afterward. If you've never had a chance to take a course on how to write effective objectives and you want the simplest framework possible for thinking about writing good objectives, Mager's ABCD model is a good one. Like, who's going to do it? What will they do? Under what conditions will they do it? And how well? So, you know, undergraduate students will be able to factor quadratic equations without use of a calculator correctly 80% of the time. Um, we typically leave off degree. You don't frequently hear, de hear degree used in outcomes anymore. Mager was building this model back in the 70s and 80s. But, um, you know, if, if you'll just create reasonable outcomes and then engage in the, the simplest possible kind of classification exercise for those outcomes, right, of saying, is this outcome relating to a fact, just like a, a definition or something? Is it a concept? Is this something where I'm going to be asked to look at examples of things I've never seen before and classify them. Is this person an entrepreneur or not? Or is that tree a conifer or not? Or things like that. Or is there some mental model I'm supposed to develop that will let me troubleshoot, like understand how a computer network is supposed to operate so I can troubleshoot it later on? Or is it just a straight up procedure with a set of steps like how to wash your hands effectively? Or are we really into the realm of principles and heuristics and guidelines where every time I 
engage in a task. I have to do it a little bit differently. Um, you know, if you can just take your outcomes and look at putting them into one of those five buckets and then seeing, are you asking students to just remember or are you asking them to actually do something? Just knowing, well, first of all, when you do this, if you're like most people, you'll see that 70% of your outcomes are fact remember outcomes. And that should terrify you and send you back into your outcomes again to work on them some more. Um, but it starts to give you a sense of what kinds of things you're asking students to learn. And if it turns out that you really, if your outcome says, I want them to be able to do this procedure, then that has some implications for what your assessment should look like. And it has some implications for what the instruction that's going to prepare people to succeed on those assessments should look like. Like, Dave, isn't this about open? I swear I'm getting to the open. But we have to set up, you know, we have to establish some of these basic effective practices or the open piece doesn't add anything to anything. I mean, if you put, it's a good example here. Like putting bacon with kale doesn't make kale any better. <laughs> sorry to any kale, any kale fans in the room, sorry. Um, Brussels sprouts, putting bacon with Brussels sprouts doesn't make them any better. Is that worse? Um, I, you, you get the point. You get the point. Oh, lipstick on a pig. Putting lipstick on a pig doesn't make it any prettier. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So a adding open to a flawed, ineffective instructional design might make it less expensive for students to engage in that flawed, ineffective instructional design. But that, that's not, it's not where we want to be starting from. All right, so kind of the, the things to think about in the context of open when you're working on your outcomes, right? So are you, lots of people want to share their textbooks, they want to share their videos, they want to share their whatever. Have you ever thought about actually sharing your learning outcomes? So the next person that comes along behind you doesn't, like, can start where you left off and maybe spend an hour instead of spending a whole day on this task. Um, you, when you're out looking that OER and figuring out which OER you want to use, do you look to see if those OER say that they're aligned to a particular outcome? Um, if someone was going to take one of your outcomes and use it in their syllabus, how would you want to be attributed? Like where, where should that go? I mean, you can imagine this, there's this attribution nightmare, it's even worse than assessment, but imagine if I had pulled outcomes from four or five different people's syllabi, like do I have to cite each one in line, like a book report or something with parentheses after everyone. So may, you know, maybe it's smart, if you're going to share your learning outcomes, maybe it's good to think about using CC0 instead of CC BY or CC BY SA or something like that, so that the if your outcomes don't have that attribution requirement on them, that gives me a little more flexibility to, of course I'm gonna cite you later, I'm not gonna plagiarize your work, but it might give me a little more kind of elbow room in how I do that and where I choose to do it so that I'm not interleaving outcome, citation, outcome, citation. Out. And the students are like, what are all these citations? I just want to know what I'm supposed to learn in this course. <laughs> and so, so I would suggest these are the kinds of things to think about. Um, alignment. So it, it's easy to make some alignment-related mistakes when you're using OER. This um, this. You know, the, the, the outcome or the objective, whatever you want to call it, really is kind of at the middle of everything. And every activity that you ask students to engage in, whether that's read this chapter or watch this video or play this game or do this simulation, every activity you're asking them to engage in, you should be asking them to engage in that activity, that activity in support of some outcome that you want them to get. And every assessment item, or every assessment task, whether it's write an essay or do this discussion, or it's an individual item on a, on a test, should be aligned with the learning outcome. They really are the center of the entire universe. And when, when you get in situations where, and particularly on the right-hand side, this is super common, you've got a syllabus with 15 outcomes on it, like the best textbook is textbook X, and you assign textbook X, and well, Gosh, it turns out textbook X teaches 28 things, not just the 15 that you need. But you ask students to spend $180 buying it, so for them to get their money's worth, like you should cover some more chapters. And like you end up doing these weird things where the material drives 
what you're doing instructionally instead of your outcomes driving it. So you're teaching things that you don't even really care uh, if they learn, or at least things that you haven't said on the syllabus that they're going to learn. And then, boy, if you get assessments on your quiz somewhere that don't align to anything that you've taught them, that's even worse. Um, I, I, I guess, well, let me ask. Backward design, by show of hands, is something that you've kind of heard of. I mean, it's, it's this uh, derogatory term. It's called backward design because it starts from outcomes. And of course, that's the way it should work, but that's not ever the way it works. And so we kind of jokingly refer to this as backwards design. All right, what should your students be able to do? How will you know if they, if they can do it? And what do you need to have them do so that they can succeed in doing the thing that will prove to you that they know how to do it? It's like the, the simplest instructional design model ever in history. Um, you know, so things to think about here in con backward design in the context of open. Um, you know, so the outcomes again are what should students be able to do. Um, you'll see here that I flipped around activities and assessment. I, you know, based on the last kind of two years of work we've been doing, traditional backward design assumes that you're going to do a lot of creating of assessments, creating of activities. So you, and, and you're, you're probably creating your outcomes as well. So you pick the outcome. What could a student do to persuade you that they've achieved the outcome? Now, what can you have them do to prepare to succeed in that assessment? But it, it turns out when you're designing uh, from OER, most of the activities, the, the books they're going to read, or the the uh, yeah the open textbooks or the essays or whatever they're going to read or the videos they're going to watch, those things all already exist. You're going to end up reusing you know 98 percent of what goes here but you're going to end up doing a lot of creating down here still because despite our work that the hewlett foundation has funded and other work that other people have done there aren't as many open assessments as there are open textbooks and open videos and things like that and so you know it's really helpful when the language and the vocabulary in the assessment matches the language and the vocabulary in the resource and um, that's one of these ways that work that you do with OER can get out of alignment and can cause you trouble when the chapter talks, the open textbook chapter that you adopt talks about it this way and the open assessment that you chose uses alternate, alternate language. Um, so I really think when you're doing backward design in the context of open, it's outcomes first, then choose your OER, which already exists, and figure out how you're going to align them. And then go through and start either creating your assessments or looking at the assessments and tweaking them to make sure that they match the approach, the language, the vocabulary, things like that that are used in the resource that you chose. Um, are you dying yet? Is this too fast, too slow, too... Okay. Uh, so activities. These are the things that we ask students to do, to read, to watch, to listen, to play, things like this. So again, for every objective, you know, choose the resource that you feel will best support student outcomes and make sure that those things are aligned. Now, um, you know, double, you remember that little five by two kind of fact, concept, principle, procedure uh, process. You know, make sure that the resources that you select are matching the level of your outcome and not just the topic of your outcome. So if you really want them to be able to calculate opportunity cost, you can pick OER that talk about opportunity cost and describe it and define it, but never show how to calculate it. And if the levels of your resources aren't matching up to the levels of your outcomes, which are going to be matched up to the level of your resource, you can still set yourself up for, for trouble. You can do a kind of really minimal alignment that says, OK, I've got an outcome about opportunity cost. I've got some content about opportunity cost. I've got assessment about opportunity cost. Awesome. But this level issue of whether you're asking them just to remember or be able to define or you're really asking them to be able to do turns out to be really important. This is another place where you can have alignment issues happen. So here, you know, consistency of vocabulary and resources and things like that. Oh man, revise around opportunities to make resources speak more directly to your students. Now, Seth, that's what this is for, right? Awesome. Okay, love it. Um, was it you or was it um, the young lady who was talking about the, the faculty member who wrote their own book? Right. It was you, right? Talk about that just a little bit more. Like, why was it? Why was that interesting? Uh, 
Um, it was a lot more pers personalized towards what he was teaching. Like he was exactly where we were in class. Mm -hmm. um, I know some sometimes we get kind of off track in other classes, like we jump around chapters and it makes it hard to follow. Right. But with this, it was like chapter one was the first week, chapter two was the second week, and it was exactly what he was saying in class, and it was exactly pertinent to what would be in the quiz. Yeah. So. Thank you. I'll, I'll slip you a fiber after. <laughs> yes. and, and that instructor can put an open license on their work and share it on the Open Oregon Resources page. <laughs> so I, I want to show you an example. I, I didn't I didn't cue this one up, but I want to show it at this point anyway, because of this awesome point that Seth yes. is making. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be super scared for the rest of the day. I'm going to tell you something wrong. <laughs> You know, when commercial textbook publishers make a textbook that they put out in the world, they, they try to develop it in a way that will be as unoffensive to as many people as possible. Right? Don't want to chase people off. My wife's from Tennessee and I'm from West Virginia and we love to talk about our eighth grade civics classes that discuss the cause of the Civil War. She wants something a little different than I did. Um, so, you know, the goal if you're trying to reach this mass market is to make something as unoffensive as possible, which also ends up making it as boring as is humanly possible, right? There's no examples of anything because examples exclude people. Like, what if you've never seen that TV show? Or what if you don't know this cultural reference or something else? Wise, poignant guide to Ruby with its, which, with its first chapter, When You Wish Upon a Fear, is... Um, is a really, really awesome example of what you can do in the context of open. So this is a textbook about learning the Ruby programming language. And it does not look like any other textbook you've ever seen about learning any programming language ever. Um, and I just, I just want to give an example. Have, have any of you ever read a technical book, like a book about Perl or PhD or MySQL or something like that? Like, you, know, you, you look on a shelf and there's eight different ones. There's one from O'Reilly and there's one from whoever. You pick them up and open them and they look exactly the same inside. Each of them, and they're indistinguishable from each other. It's because they have to offend as few people as possible, right? But wise, poignant guide, which is openly licensed so that you can, uh, you can revise and remix, is a little bit different in its approach. So in this first chapter here, um, there are these cartoon foxes who are participating. They're actually just having a conversation with themselves that's interrupting the flow of the instruction, actually, is what that means. So, man, his examples are weird. This is this kind of side commentary as he's going through and giving examples of variables and how strings work in Ruby and things like that. And then one of the foxes strikes on this idea. Hey, say, say something really loud. Maybe he'll use it in one of his examples. Like what, like chunky bacon? Not, not that I'm obsessed with bacon with another bacon example. You know, so you know, the instruction is going on and the foxes are, are trying to be loud. And, come on, seriously, chunky bacon. You know, they're trying to get his attention and eventually, after they yell, after they yell enough, Variables which begin with a dollar sign are global. There you go, right there. <laughs> Chunky bacon is used as an example, and the cartoon foxes are high fiving. Woo! We did it! I don't even know what that is, but we're in the book. Right? So, this book has a very strong personality. And the, the second that you see this book, the, the very second you see it, you either know that this is the book for you to learn Ruby from or that you want nothing to do with this book. It, it, it's unlike any other textbook you've ever seen. You know, the, the artwork gets increasingly kind of Napoleon Dynamite-ish as it, as it goes on. But when you, have, when you have open material, you can feel more free to do things, but to include examples of cartoon foxes, to include crazy illustrations, because you know the next person down the line, if they don't like it, they can just pull it out and put their own cartoon foxes in, or put their own example in, or whatever it is. 
And instead of this dry, boring, just makes you want to put your head through a wall kind of reading experience, you get something with some personality and some flavor to it. And it's very, very common on feedback that comes from students on the bubble sheets that they fill out about how satisfied they are, they are with the course at the end of the semester. When you've adopted an open resource, it's very common for students in the free response place to say things like, the things we read before class were actually related to what we spoke about in class. And you made that comment just now. And we, we don't think that students are super sophisticated about this because they don't have a PhD in art history or whatever. But, but they actually pick up on skipping around in the book, and that's confusing, and you had me read all of this, and then we talked about that, which I guess is loosely related, but, but when you've broken the course down to its outcomes, and you have chosen each resource that goes with each outcome, the, the whole classroom experience is different, and students absolutely get it. I'm so glad. I really know. After, yeah, see me after class. Um, you know, so these opportunities really are super, super key. You know, other, other things you can do to get sideways here are, you know, license compatibility, compati compatibility issues again, and then these issues of managing attributions. And unless, if you're doing any remix, remixing at all, if you really are pulling things from different sources, again, this kind of attribution in the footer probably isn't going to cut it. Um, and the, the link between assessments and activities is probably blurrier than you think, at least if it's not, I really hope. Maybe if this is all I do today, then I'll have added some value before I go. You, we're used to thinking of assessments as all being really high stakes, like everything that we ask a student to do is contributing to their grade in some way. And there's no opportunity for the kind of practice where you can practice and mess up and not be penalized for it. Um, this is one of the things. It's not the most important thing, but it's one thing that's really important about gameplay and why people love games. Because it doesn't matter how many times it takes you to beat that Angry Birds level, like after the third time, it doesn't say F and move you on. <laughs> you just, there's no penalty. You just keep trying and playing and trying until you can do it and then you get to move on. So this idea that some, you know, there are some activities we ask students to engage in, like reading a book, that those are activities that support learning but don't contribute to the grade. We understand that. And we understand assessments, things we ask students to do that really impact their grade. But I think there's more room for assessments that are no stakes or that are, at least are low, very low stakes. And giving, giving opportunities to practice and find out if you're getting it without being in such a panic that if I didn't get it the first time, it's gonna create this huge hole in my grade that I have to crawl out of. You know, so I think it's really interesting as you sit down and think about your assessment strategy you know, to kind of matrix out no stakes opportunities, low stakes opportunities, high stakes opportunities against who's going to do the grading? Like, are there things that the machine can grade? Are there things that students can grade? Are there things that you can grade? And figure out kind of what goes in each of these boxes. Because depending on your class and, uh, you know, the discipline that you're teaching in and what the practice is, probably kind of half of these boxes are filled in the way you're currently teaching the class and the others are just completely empty. And doing some brainstorming around this turns out to be a super fruitful uh, and really fun exercise. Because anything that we can do down here to give students these kind of opportunities to, like machine graded multiple choice self checks in the middle of a book. Like, am I getting it or not? I just want to know, like, can I go on or do I need to keep reading it? Or if you allow multiple attempts on, on quizzes, then those first attempts are really low stakes because it's, it's about helping me understand what I do and don't know and where I need to study more before I come back and do my second attempt. And, and the literature around having students grade uh, each other's work is super rich. Um, you know, this, uh, well actually I guess that slide's coming next. This slide's about kind of providing timely feedback and minimizing the amount of time between when a student does work and when they get their feedback like, imagine if you said something really rude to me, and then a week later, I slapped you in the face. <laughs> the, the, the feedback needs to come really close to the event that the feedback is happening about, right? Getting feedback two weeks later in my exam is, is less useful. This is one of the strongest uh, kind of outcomes of all in Hattie's book, is this idea of establishing teacher-student relationships relationships 
that in, and his description of them includes words like empathy and care and things like that. And I think there are opportunities for us to think about OER. Um, everybody knows what a flipped classroom is. The flipped classroom, though, really raises the stakes when you have students who can't afford their materials. Because now you're counting on them to do all their reading, all their prep, to get all the content outside of class, and you just want to you know, do projects and assignments and group work and things like that in class. When you're using OER, you can flip knowing that every single student will have all the material that they need. So OER really enables flipping in a powerful way. And if all of that kind of stuff is happening outside of class, the time that you're actually together, you can use doing more types of activities that allow you to kind of build and establish relationships. I think creating templates for assessments uh, based on that five by two box is really powerful, but I'm not saving as much time for um, talking as I wanted to. Well, I'm going to keep going. And having students create assessments as note taking for themselves, um, that then you can invite them if they'd like to share the assessments that they've created uh, to help grow the body of material that's available. Uh, this kind of having students create this kind of work fell under uh, the study skills category and has an effect size of almost 0.6. You can see down there at the bottom. Oh my gosh, if, if we could just help students understand that one hour of study spread out in 15 minute blocks over four days is a billion times more effective than one hour of study at one time, we could like save mankind. You, you can reinforce some of this uh, you know, by including assessments from earlier parts of the semester, later in the semester, which encourages them to go back through and restudy. But, um, you know, this has an effect size of over 0.7. This work goes all the way back into the 1800s about how often you study, how recently you've studied, how likely you are to remember again. And cramming is literally the worst possible thing you can do to promote retention beyond like half an hour later. Um, but I, I think for me, my favorite piece of where it really starts to rethink around open pedagogy and around what can we do with our assignments um, when we're using OER that we can't do when we're using commercial materials comes to this idea of disposable assignments. And so kind of the, the stereotypical disposable, disposable assignment is the, um, the two-page response paper. Like, I want to make sure everybody read the chapter for today, so in order to make sure that you read the chapter, I'm going to assign you to write a little two-page response paper to what you read. Students hate writing those almost as much as you hate reading them. They hate them, you hate them, they're a huge waste of time and energy, they actually suck value out of the world. <laughs> and, and, and we can do better. Um, Clay Shirky, any Clay Shirky fans in the room? Clay talks about the cognitive surplus. Um, Clay's a, Nate, how would you describe, is he a media scholar, would you say? Well, he is now. He, he is now, he is now. He was at NYU for a while, but. Anyway, the, I, Clay's idea of the cognitive surplus is like an answer to the question, where does Wikipedia come from? Um, you know, we, we have Encyclopedia Britannica, it takes tons of time, it's really expensive to create, and then all of a sudden this thing that's 1,500 times bigger than Encyclopedia Britannica just springs out of nowhere for free, like how does that happen? And it happens because at night we all go home and we do some grading, we do some other stuff, and then we sit around and watch TV or play video games or do whatever for like three hours before we go to bed, and there's just all this brain power that's not doing anything during that period. And Clay says the way you explain Wikipedia is you look at this cognitive surplus and you say, if half of 1% of people living in developing nations where this cognitive surplus thing can be a thing, spent 15 minutes a night, then you end up with you know six billion minutes of people contrib contributing to Wikipedia or contributing to open source software projects or things like this. But there's, there's this leftover energy that's going unharnessed. If you think, think about the amount of time that the students in your class spend doing homework in a year. Now, now if there is a way to reshape that homework assignment so that in addition to reinforcing the learning that you wanted to do, you could also have them create something that actually had some value in the world, then that would be really interesting. So, um, is there a way to create assignments that students see value in doing 
Okay, that's a huge if. Is, is there a way to create assignments that we would see value in sitting down to grade? There's a big if. If you could put those two things together, then you could make the world a better place. Now, the highest of all the things that I'm talking about today in terms of their effect size, um, John looks at studies where students are asked to what he calls organize and transform material, which should sound a lot to you like revise and remix because that's essentially what it is. Um, the effect size for asking students to engage in this kind of work is 0.85. It's the biggest of all the ones we've seen. And so I wanna, I wanna give a couple of examples of asking students to do this kind of work. And if, if you've seen or heard me talk about these in the past, I have a couple that are my favorites and I tend to stay on them, so I apologize if you've seen these before. But this is from, uh, this is a video that I had students do for a class on uh, new media and learning. This example is so old that blogs and wikis were considered new media when we were talking about it. Um, but so this is, this is the Kung Fu assignment. And it, it, I call it the Kung Fu assignment because if you remember those great Kung Fu movies of your youth, the person's mouth moves, and then the audio happens. And they're never in sync with each other. And it's just kind of goofy and fun, and that's, what, that's, part, of, that's part of Kung Fu movies. The English is never synced up with people's mouth moving. So this assignment says, go find either some openly licensed video or some old public domain video and dub new audio over top of it that you create yourself to teach a principal. And so this, uh, this group of students, so three, I think there are three students in this group, who instead of each writing an essay about what the difference between blogs and wikis is, work together to write this script, edit this video down, and do these terrible, terrible voiceovers, which uh, th this video is about four minutes long. I'm gonna play you just a little bit of it so you get a sense of it. This is too fun not to play. So you actually had Kennedy and Nixon in your class? They were actually brought Kennedy back. <laughs> about freedom of speech and the fundamental human right, 
I'll guarantee that every American has access to every wiki. He's making all these promises. And Nixon is saying, no, 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 it's important that we can control the information that's available to people, that we can control the message. He talks about his Watergate blog. Um, let, me, let me skip up just to the end for a minute. Because Kennedy's closing remarks really are uh, really the bills. Any final comments, Mr. Kennedy? In closing, I want the people of this nation to know that with a wiki, your voice will be heard. I will ensure that everyone has access to every wiki. Let me be the warrior of your wiki. <laughs> Ask me what your wiki can do for you, but what you can do for your wiki. <laughs> Every single person in this room has been to like five conferences where at the end of the conference somebody said, we don't want this conversation to die. We want to keep things going, so I've made a wiki for all of us to participate in after the, and then nothing ever happens, right? So this, this idea, Kennedy saying, ask not what your wiki can do for you, but what you can do for your wiki. I mean, it's so beautifully captured <laughs> what, wiki, what, what idea of a wiki is about. And if this video, now I've downloaded it so that we wouldn't need, uh, need Wi-Fi for it here. This is a homework assignment that has been viewed 52,000 times. <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a brilliant piece of work on a bunch of levels. And, and whoa. And the, these students could have all, you know, these three guys could have all written two-page essays about the difference between blogs and wikis. Um, but actually, if, if you go to Google and just type in blogs versus wikis, this will be absolutely be on the top page of results. It's crazy. Um, what, one more project, and then, and then we'll get to q and I'll skip the rest of it. Project management for instructional designers is a course I used to teach um, when I was still full-time at BYU that unsurprisingly is about Project, manager, project management in the context of instructional design. There is no book in the world called Project Management for Instructional Designers. I think this co course is taught at 30 colleges around the country, maybe. Um, so what we did for this class, well, how much of this story to tell? Um, I was complaining to a friend of mine that I'd found, I'd managed to find an open textbook about project management, but it was written for business school students. And all the examples were like, you have to get 30 million tons of rebar and so much concrete all to Singapore at the same time. They're coming from different, and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm glad somebody cares about that, but I don't care about it. My students don't care about it either. It was really close to what I needed, but it just wasn't quite right. And my colleague just backhanded me, oh, this is back, just backhanded me and said, it's an open textbook. Like, make it the book you need it to be. That's the point. And I said, awesome. Yes, and then immediately realized how much work that was going to be and said, no, no, I don't think I can do that. And then in, in my despair and laziness, I realized the obvious solution is have the students make the changes to the book that need to be made to the book, right? So every time I taught this class, I'd, um, you know, I'd outlined some of the improvements I thought needed to be made, made to the book, but I'd always leave it open for students to make other suggestions and then let them form into teams. And all semester long, instead of writing essays or taking quizzes or whatever about project management, they were rewriting parts of the textbook. And their contributions are going into the textbook. So the, the very first time I taught it, you know, in textbooks, there are those little pull-out boxes that are colored yellow or green or something. They have a little case study in them. One group of students just went through and rewrote every case study in the entire textbook. And um, that as a grader, you feel more like you're editing contributions to a book, because that's actually what you're doing, and you're helping them improve them, and the amount of understanding a student has to have to make up an imaginary case that demonstrates the principle effectively is actually, I would argue, way more than what they need to go and pass a quiz on that. So students made all kinds of contributions to this book over the years. They went out, they one group went out and shot a set of video cases of practicing project managers that work in instructional design. So at the top of every chapter now, there are these three video interviews with these three people. Um, and probably my favorite one, the one that's a top bullet here, is about 
there's, there's something called the Project Management Professional Certification. Um, which if you, the, the, average, the median salary for a person that holds a certification is $106,000 a year. And so I tell that to my students on the first day of class every time, and then they become suddenly much more interested in this class. <laughs> Only for a week or so. Then it wears off. But um, the books, the study guides for this certification exam are crazy. They cost $150, $200. So one group of students went to our library, got all the books the library had about training for this exam, and used those to find out what's the structure of the exam and how many questions are asked about each topic and things like that. And that group rewrote and reorganized this book so that now you can use this book to prepare for the exam. So now there's a free book you can use to prepare as opposed to having to buy a $200 book. Um, and if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see that all the students that make substantive contributions to the book, I add as co-authors to the book because they've made substantive contributions to the book. So this book has some huge number of co-authors on it now, and they all leave the class now with something to put on their resume. So they're a co-author on a textbook. And we're not the only ones that use it. We, we are kind of the stewards of this book uh, at BYU. But this book is used in several of the other graduate educational technology programs that offer the same course. Um, I'm not going to talk about that one. The point being, you, you, you couldn't go grab, I don't know what's a good example, but th th this public domain Nixon versus Kennedy video, you can take that you can legally dub over top of it and do different things with it. And it's, that assignment is all enabled by the fact that those materials are open. They're free and you have the 5R permissions in them because they're in the public domain. And in the case of the project management for instructional designers, those kinds of things I'm asking students to do are only possible because the book is open. This is a McGraw-Hill book. We couldn't replace the case studies. We couldn't put new video in it. We couldn't do any of that. Um, I, I guess the last thing I want to say is that you know, one of the things that we do at Lumen is we create open source software that builds on top of other open source software to make it easier to use um, OER. So I think many of you know what WordPress and Pressbooks are, um, but we also, you know, we've written several new modules that go with this to make it easier to manage, um, manage those attributions in a way that faculty don't accidentally delete them. Uh, you know, doing out learning outcomes alignment, uh, implementing LTI so that you can build and manage your OER in this open source system that has its own life, that never dies, that the URL always works for, that students can always get back to even after the semester is over. But you can use LTI to show it inside the learning management system during the semester. And then they can always go to the permanent URL later if, if they still want access to it like that. Um, the thin common cartridge export is the way that you uh, take all these links and put them inside your learning management system in like a three or five minute process. You bring all the content into the LMS without moving any of the content. All the content stays over here. Um, and then that, if you know WordPress, you know WordPress revisions every edit to a page. So now I can start to look across a community of people and see you made this edit to chapter three of Intro to Psych, and you made this edit, and you added a video, and you did that, and like, what changed across there? And it, it enables that stewardship role to be able to pull some of those different parts together. Um, and if, if there's real interest in that during the Q&A, I can show you, um, I can do like a little demo, but. And the, the, our open embedded assessments tool too is, I think is really awesome. This is an open source tool that we developed jointly uh, with MIT with funding from Hewlett. And it's basically, you know how you can take a YouTube video and you can take like one little line of code and drop a YouTube video in the middle of any page anywhere. This is a tool that lets you take a quiz and drop it in the middle of any page anywhere. So you can make a one or two item quiz that doesn't count for anything, that's a self check and you can drop it right smack in the middle of the chapter so that after I finish reading this, I can say, oh, did that, did I get that or not? And you can have that short turnaround opportunity to do no stakes, very quick feedback kind of check. So I'll skip the demo. I'll also mention just very briefly that if you're interested in this idea of personalized or adaptive learning that we've, um, we're in the middle now of a $3 million Gates funded grant to develop some additional tools so that OER can be delivered in these personalized and adaptive ways. Okay. Whew.
That's the end. Now, now somebody other than me, please talk. Questions, comments, infuriations? Something you were hoping I was going to go deeper on? Yes? Um, okay, the short version of that story, I said I'm from West Virginia, um, I, I grew up in not the most resource rich environment, um, but uh, so Marshall in West Virginia is my alma mater, and while I was going to school there, I was also working as a webmaster at the university, this would be 96, 97, back when nobody knew what to do. Our webmaster position, like people are like, I guess we need a webmaster, but what do we do with this person? I don't know. Co-locate them with a the CIO. They can share an administrative assistant. And like nobody knew what to do with webmasters. It was really fun. Um, yeah, I shared an office and a secretary with the CIO as the webmaster of the university. Um, anyway, one day I was working on developing a, a calculator, a JavaScript calculator that you could use in a web page. And as I was doing that, I realized that that calculator in the web page was importantly different from the calculators like at my elementary school that you sat in groups and waited for the calculator to come around so you could have your turn to do things. That um, physical calculators somehow implied waiting your turn to have access to one, but if you could make it digital and put it online, a million people could all use it at the same time. Like the same way that you have to wait, like I, I have to wait for my wife to finish reading the sports before I can look at the sports in the newspaper in the morning. But a million people can all read sports at CNN.com at the same time. I mean, there's something fundamentally different about digital than, than print. And tons of people had realized that before me. That wasn't some novel discovery that I made, but I was kind of sitting in my office that day. When I realized that, I thought, you know, other other people surely have realized this, and I read it, and I thought, ah, oh, so this is how, this is how Bill Gates becomes a multi-billionaire, right? Like you build the not the calculator, you build the Windows 95 one time, and it costs you nothing to make an infinite number of copies of it, and you sell free copies for two hundred dollars a piece to everybody who can you can persuade to buy them. That's how you get really really rich. So I thought, so you know that. If you understand this principle of digital means free copy, free infinite copies that cost almost nothing to move around, then you could either get really rich, or if you could figure out how to pay for the development of the thing, like how to get it made the first time, then you could give it away to everybody in the world at no additional cost. And so that was for me kind of personally like one of those heavens Heart and like the being the ray of sunlight comes down and oh and I really had this like almost religious experience. I thought, you know, now that I understand that that's true, I'm somehow responsible for what I do with the rest of my life because I understand that. And um, you know, so early on when I first started doing this work, it was I was interested in it because it addressed some need that I had experienced in West Virginia growing up, but I also had this really strong sense of kind of moral obligation to do the work. Um, and then over time, it became more about just really loving the work. And you have to be pretty crazy to choose to stop being tenured and start being an adjunct. <laughs> As my wife will tell you. <laughs> Create new OER, like from scratch? Mm -hmm. Like, are there grants for this, or is there any sort of model that might, you know, you might need to know how? To yeah, so I think my, my first advice would be do your literature review. You know, make sure there's not already three things out there that you're going to spend a lot of effort and then have duplicated somebody else's work. Ask your librarians. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do your literature review first. Um, but then if you decide to do it, I think, you know, the, the way that we, so we facilitate that process, and the way that we would do it 
would be to you know, bring together, hopefully, people across multiple institutions, not just folks from one institution, but bring you together, bring your course syllabi with you, look at what's the superset of all the outcomes that you teach plus the one that he teaches and the ones that she teaches, and some of them will be in common and some of them will be unique, but you look at the superset of all of those um, and then, then try at that small outcome level to see what you can find that might be available for individual outcomes and block that in. And then whatever's left in terms of gaps, then that's a process of kind of splitting that up among yourselves. Um, you've got all kinds of considerations around kind of common formatting standards and style guides and things like that. If you're writing a lot of material or if you're going to do video, are you going the Khan Academy super low cost route or the Steven Spielberg kind of high production values? And, just so, and, and sometimes why write when you could do video? is a question that I think is an interesting question to ask. Um, but I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find any discipline where if you lay all the learning outcomes out top to bottom, you can't find several of those that are already covered by OER. And it's really a process of gap filling as opposed to creating a table of contents, starting a chapter one, section one, and just writing 400 new pages, you know. And then, you know, then there are like, what technology do you use to write so that, because you're going to want to write, and then at some point you're going to want to like take whatever you had and hand it one person to the right and do some review and how you coordinate that review and how that feedback gets in. And does the chapter owner, does the chapter author own, kind of reject or accept decisions around revisions that other people make or things like that? Yeah, is that helpful? Okay, yeah, good. good. Yeah. So I have a, a thought about this. Um, I'm from Portland Community College, just down the road, big institution. 76% of our faculty are adjunct part time mm -hmm. instructors who don't get paid for course design. Yep. Um, and so I feel like I've, you know, our bookstore manager talked to me too about the rise of commercial textbook popularity being associated with our reliance on part time instructors, those mm -hmm. kind of lines going up. It's appealing to be able to tap. Mm -hmm. from one instructor to another when you don't have pay people to do course development. Yep. Um, I miss, though, the days when we didn't have those free open options because people were forced to do more intentional course design and focus mm -hmm. on their objectives. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to make some of these components of open education <coughs> more accessible to our part-time colleagues. Yeah, wow. So. Um, I think the, the way to think about that is think about all the other things that the full-time faculty do and their relationship and how the part-time people are brought into that. You know, the, typically the full-time faculty carry the majority of the load, they're responsible at the end of the day, they're doing a lot of the work, but, but part-time faculty do get pulled into those things in, different, in smaller ways and in different roles. Um, and I will say that some of the most amazing work that's been done, like even in that biology, has been done by part-time faculty, not full-time faculty. So you know, rule, rule number one is make sure they all understand they have permission to do whatever you're comfortable with them having permission to do in terms of revising and remixing and finding new videos and pulling new stuff in and kind of give them all the permission that you can and then kind of watch for what goodness organically happens. Um, but then if, if there are opportunities to bring them in for a half a day or a day to sit with the full-time faculty and to talk through things and do some kind of quick, like let's take one hour and you do that and I'm going to do this and you do this and then like at the end we'll pull it together. Um, you, you can't ask them to do a lot. You can give them permission to do a lot and some of them will and there are still small ways that you can involve them if you're kind of thoughtful about um, looking at your current process or involving them in other things and figuring out how this could fit into that process. But it's really different everywhere. So I don't know how to give a good specific answer other than do something that meets what you already do in context outside of OER. Except to say, give them permission and then be kind of be ready to be really surprised by someone. So this idea of the disposable assignments really kind of resonates with me, and um, I'm wondering if you or maybe other people have ideas about how to make assignments that are not disposable when you are using a platform like Moodle that erases everything everybody does. 
So I'd be curious to hear what other people think. I mean, my approach to that is um, I started, oh geez, in 04 or 05, I just started requiring all my students to get a blog and they post their work to the blog and then what they submit is the link to the page on their blog where they submitted it. And then even after Moodle closes, their blog is still there. It's kind of like their personal portfolio of all the, the things that they've done. And if there's stuff that they've done that they decide they don't like, they can delete it or something when the semester is over, but give them a space that they control where they can post their, well, actually you don't even have to give it to them. Tell them to go to blogger.com or wordpress.com or go get a free blog. And you, um, you might need to take five minutes in class to show somebody how to make a post to a blog, but these guys pretty much know how to do that, largely speaking. Um, but just have them do their work in the open in a space that they control. And then, um, I mean, that's the OER strategy I was talking about too, right? Is keep the OER outside in an open place that you control and just kind of push the links to that into the learning management system. So it's the same with the work that they do. And if you can run the discussions outside and the discussions don't die, you know, the, the balance there is how comfortable are they with the idea of their work being public and open? Because you can't require them to do that. But you can explain why that's useful and valuable to them and how it starts to give Google some things to index about them that aren't pictures of them drinking on the weekend on Facebook or something else. Um, how they can use it to build up some professional, um, you know, kind of digital identity for themselves. And th there will always be a couple of students who say, you know what, that just scares the heck out of me. I don't want to do that. I'm not willing to do that. I just want to upload all my stuff into the LMS. I never want, I don't even want you to see it. I don't want anybody to see it. And, and great. You know, God bless them, let them, let them do that. But I think a, a very brief, kind of articulate discussion of why working in the open is good um, uh, will we'll win most of the people over there. I had a, you know, this video has been watched 50,000 times. When I very, very first started doing this, I would highlight, um, on my blog, I would highlight student work that I thought was kind of exemplary from the week. Um, and I was blogging about other stuff, but I was using my professional blog to do some of this kind of course-related blogging too. And um, one day, anybody know Stephen Downs, the Canadian EdTech blogger? So he, he runs a, a daily a newsletter called OL Daily. It's online learning daily that I really recommend if you're interested in this topic at all that you subscribe to. It's great. Anyway, Stephen saw one of the, Stephen saw on my blog a comment that I had made about a piece of student work and he looked at it and he thought it was interesting. So the next day, in Stephen's newsletter that goes out to 30,000 people was a link to the student's homework assignment. And not all 30,000 people came, but a couple of thousand people came. And you know the darndest thing, the next week, uh, every single piece of writing by students in that class was more thoughtful, was longer, <laughs> was more articulate. Right? Like they realized like, oh my gosh, this is a real thing in a real world that real people are seeing that uh, like, I better get my act together. And students are always kind of competing with each other a little bit, that kind of stuff anyway. But there's just so many benefits from having them work in their own space that they own in the open, where Google can index it, where they can start to build an identity. And really, no matter what kind of class you're teaching, you can find opportunities to encourage them to do that. Yeah, so that was um, actually some of the original thinking around disposable assignments came out of service learning stuff. So there's a um, there's an online charter school in Utah called Mountain Heights Academy. It used to be called the Open High School of Utah, but it's it's a charter that we started as an experiment to see what um, how close could you come to running an entire high school exclusively on OER. So the charter document, as approved by the state, prohibits the school from ever using any commercial curriculum. Um, so we started this in 2007. And one of, the, one of the kind of three main commitments in the charter is this commitment to service learning. And the idea was that students can serve, they do, they do once a month, they do go out and do like community service too, but there's opportunities for students to help and serve each other by 
rewriting pieces of the course that they feel are you know not clear or they have what they call their next gen OER project and next gen OER is basically student created OER where uh, some of the some percentage of the assignments students can create material that could potentially be pulled back into the course next year when it's offered to to the next batch of kids and of course that's attributed to them and things like that I think. Um, and I don't think I pulled it into this, into this presentation, but one of the other really effective uh, strategies that Hattie talks about in visible learning is uh, kind of peer tutoring or uh, students teaching each other. And if you have students take the open content that exists, remix it and personalize it in some way that speaks to them. Like, I like assignments that are things like, you know, pick a popular TV show, pick a popular movie, pick a book you've read, and like talk about this principle in that context. And then, then we're going to come and we're, you're going to sit down and you're going to teach the person next to you about photosynthesis or whatever using some example from Lost or whatever it is that you did. And have them cross-teach with the material that they adapted. You just get, like you start hitting like every high impact practice on the Hattie list in that one assignment. You've got them organizing and transforming, you've got them teaching each other, you've got immediate feedback coming in. It's, um, it's great. It's very good. Amy. Coming back to Jamie's first question, um, something that I was thinking about while you were talking. Um, so one of Jamie's colleagues in the Clackamas English Department said that he realized that uh, the person who you know, does all the thinking and creates the beautiful fancy thing is the person who gets to do the learning, which is such a beautiful demonstration of the reason for this open pedagogy. But I'm also wondering whether you see any tension with, um, early in your talk you talked about like, hey, we've got this open stacks biology book and then this school took care of all the handouts and this school took care of all the quiz questions. Do you see any tension in that because students need to, you know, every time they go through they've got to do some exercises to get the learning, but if if you say like, oh, Clackamas figured out the quiz question thing, you're all set with that. Like where where do those two things kind of meet in the middle? You know what I'm asking? So like, that like is it possible that all the work could be done and there's nothing left for students to do? Well, is that the not exactly, but you know, we don't want everyone to reinvent the wheel, but at the same time, students are, you know, starting in one point and need to be moved to yeah, another point, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, that's why I like um, these kind of assignments where you say, pick a current event, pick a movie, pick a book, pick a song, pick a something, like, you know, how does Taylor Swift relate to whatever we just talked about? Um, because those, those are really hyper local, hyper temporal. Like students will love those, and one year later, people look at them and be like, "Oh my gosh, seriously, we're talking about Justin Bieber still, or, or, or we're talking about Lost that hasn't been on TV for." I know my parents watch that you know, kind, of, kind of comment. So a asking them to take the material and apply it to some context that they really know well, um, you get these kinds of. 70s fashion kind of effect when they look at ones that have been done a year or two or three before. Um, and they can they can still kind of understand that, but there's always a new book or a new movie or a new whatever for them to recontextualize some of that principle and somehow or talk about how if you took, you know, what would this, how would this principle, if we brought photosynthesis into Jurassic World, like, rewrite one scene from Jurassic World using photosynthesis. So there's always something that you can do that is really engaging to them right now that they've just seen or just heard or just experienced that, because it's all about trying to help them connect something new to what they already know and establishing those connections and kind of getting that context integrated. Um, and so there's always new context. Yeah. I'd like to ask you to say more about uh, your comment, why did I when you can use video. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Um, I could talk about it for, <laughs> for a long time. Um, so watching my, so my family is a very eclectic consumer of education services. So my kids at some period of time are like my, my two oldest girls right now do some homeschool, they do some core academic work through Mountain Heights Academy, and they do some work at the local brick and mortar for concurrent enrollment or to play in an orchestra or something like that. And they're kind of all over the place. Um, and it's really interesting to, um, my old, 
oldest daughter is a very critical consumer of these services. <laughs> and um, there are some classes she takes, well, all the classes she takes use some video. And some of them have the video on YouTube, and some of them have the video in another service called Vimeo. And YouTube has variable speed control, and Vimeo does not. And so when there's something on YouTube, she'll watch it at two times speed or two and a half times speed or something, and just kind of sit and really focus and listen to it. And we're just like, what? Then she'll hit the skip back button and go back 30 seconds and listen to it again a couple times and take it through. But man, when she has to listen to something on Vimeo that she can't adjust the speed for, then it's just the same. Like once you get used to hearing people to studying at that faster speed, or if I listen to my audiobooks at two or three times speed, I don't know if anybody else does that, but it becomes difficult to listen to, uh, to something else. I just think there are, there are opportunities to, A, just kind of provide some variety, because no matter how much video you create, you're gonna assign them to do a ton of reading anyway. So add some variety by creating some video. And B, it seems like, I don't know, for her and her friends, they feel somehow like they're, they're winning or getting ahead or cheating a little bit or something in a positive way when they can listen to it at two times speed rather than listening to it at normal speed. And being able to hit that skip back button and listen to you say it as many times as, as they want to. Um, I'm a huge fan of writing. She's a huge fan of reading. Um, but there are things you can do persuasively with tone of voice and facial expression and things like that that can make the same content um, more interesting or more engaging when you're saying it or telling it or your passion's coming through in it. It's really hard to get passion to come through in writing. It's possible. Um, but I think A, just for sake of variety, and B, um, for sake of speed, uh, too, I think if you've got some principle that you need to cover and you're kind of staring at the idea of trying to write that out and turn it into something that you expect to have a certain level of kind of quality and production values, because writing is writing and it's sacred to some people. The idea of flipping on your <laughs> webcam and just kind of talking into your camera for seven or ten minutes about it and, oh, I made a mistake. Oops, I just keep going because people make mistakes when they talk in lecture or whatever. I, I just think there's a range of reasons to think about. Every time you think about writing something, think, would this be quicker, cheaper, easier? Would it add some variety? Is this a topic I really want my passion to come through about as opposed to something that's more kind of information delivery oriented because I don't have time to craft the writing in a way that would make the passion come through? I mean, those, those are the ways I would think about that. It's, not, it's nothing anti-writing. It's not that well, kids can't read anymore, we should give them all video. It's, it's, it's nothing like that. Um, but, you know, I almost went back to food. I learned I can't do food with this group. Um, but well, eating the same meal or the same kind of meal for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, like just reading, 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 reading all the time. Um, it, there are opportunities for us to make it a little more, to add some more variety to it than that. I think it reduces cognitive load too. It, it can. You know, I mean, it depends on what's happening in the. Right, so that there's good cognitive load and there's extraneous cognitive load, right? And depending on what's happening in the background and what you're wearing and what you're doing, um, yeah. yeah, that's actually, that's a longer conversation, I think, but potentially, yes. And I just realized now, Amy's not pointing at someone, she's showing me her wrist, which has a clock, <laughs> has a very small clock on it. She's indicating that we're, we're past time. One, any last burning thoughts? Okay, thanks Thank very much. Thank you so much.